It's the day many families in India spend their lives dreaming of, their daughter's wedding day. But a hidden menace lurks behind the veil, dowry deaths. In India, where many husbands demand financial payments from their bride's family, one woman dies every hour in a dowry-related case. Now, this deadly tradition has arrived on Australian shores. I'm Steve Chow. On this edition of 101 East, we investigate how dowry-related violence is killing women in Australia's Indian community. The wedding ceremony took place in big farmhouse, spreading uh, four or five acres. More than 1,000 persons took part in that wedding ceremony. Deepshika Gadara was married in India in 2007. But when she came to Australia to live with her new husband, there was no happily ever after. Things are going on behind the curtain. I was not aware of these things. And Deepshika didn't tell me. And on the Sunday, 14th December, I got a phone call that Sunil has murdered Deepshika. And after killing her, he himself committed the suicide. In India's capital, New Delhi, Deepshika Gadara's father and mother pore over old photos. They're a painful reminder of what they've lost. A qualified physiotherapist, at 25, Deepshika had the world at her feet when her family arranged her marriage to Australian citizen Sunil Benawal. He had been living in Australia, in Melbourne, and working in a bank. And uh, first impression was a uh, good impression. He was a uh, very beautiful guy, a smart guy, well-educated and uh, well-behaved. Outwardly, he was looking a well social person. And uh, I was very satisfied with him. I was uh, agreed uh, for the marriage. I accepted his proposal. Deepshika's sister, Divya, says once the couple agreed on the marriage, a dowry was organised. Mm, yeah, the dowry was given in the marriage. Gold jewellery and diamond necklaces and all like that. Usually in India, people, um, especially um, daughters' parents, they think that um, it would be good to give some gifts to their daughter so that it would be keeping her happy and uh, you know um, the in-laws they would not be complaining and they would be treating uh, um, their daughter well and so just to see their um, daughter's happiness they would usually give um, expensive items, give dowry. The dowry is an ancient custom which started as a gift for the bride in lieu of her inheritance. Where it becomes a pernicious uh, or a toxic practice is that the gifts are not just for the young lady, but they are uh, also for the extended family in huge amounts. And it seems that was the case for Deepshika. Her family say, soon after she moved to Australia, her husband and his family began demanding more and more. They would show their greediness. They would uh, want some expensive gifts from us every time, even on the other occasions, like when my brother got married. I remember when initially uh, she had come here, the in-laws, they were um, saying abusive uh, language to her and uh, they were complaining that your parents did not give enough um, in the marriage. So at that time it started. After six months, the extended family went there for the tour purpose uh, 
in Australia in Melbourne and they, they behaved uh, with Deep Shikha very rudely, taunted her sometime and uh, teased her, uh, harassed her. Just one year into her marriage, things got so bad, Deep Shikha went to the police and made a statement. One night, Sunil's uncle got drunk and he verbally abused me and my family for not paying enough dowry. And that night, Sunil slapped me twice across my face. The family left and Sunil has been bitter since they left about not enough dowry being paid. In her typed statement, the police described dowry as Indian currency, a fatal mistake according to psychiatrist Dr Manjula O'Connor, who says she's treated hundreds of dowry abuse victims. The way to understand how police did not really understand dowry is by reading their report, which says dowry, which is Indian currency. Dowry is not an Indian currency. Dowry is the gifts that are given but that was the only way they could understand what that meant. If this was in India, the police would have known the seriousness of that situation, that this is the kind of situation that leads to murders and, and deaths of women, and they would have taken serious action against the groom. Deepshika's father traveled to Australia and confronted her husband but he also failed to understand the gravity of her situation. I asked them, what, what happened, Sunil? Sunil told, told me that I am not interested in your daughter. I, I don't like your daughter. Uh, I am going to give her up. I am going to uh, divorce her. Divorce carries a heavy social stigma in India. So despite the problems in the marriage, her father pleaded with Sunil not to leave Deepshika. I convinced him, him that please go and please pull on, please both should live uh, in, uh, together happily and lovingly. Please uh, don't do such um, terrible things uh, with me. Uh, I am mis living in, uh, in India, 12,000 kilometers away from here. I can't help you. If she is uh, separated, where she will go? Where, uh, where she'll be live? It will be very trouble for, for her. But the relationship only got more violent. Over the next four years, the police were called five times to the couple's home for domestic violence incidents. Her husband faced serious assault charges and a number of apprehended violence orders, but Deepshika persuaded police to drop them all, saying more than once that she wanted to return to her marriage because she was concerned about her family's reputation and honour if the relationship failed. In early 2011, Deepshika gave birth to a son, but the happy family snaps hid the continued abuse she endured. Finally, in October 2014, she left her husband, sharing the custody of their little boy. Two months later, a routine pickup from Sunil's house ended in tragedy. When she went inside that night, he quarreled first and spoke loudly and uh, uh, after that I think uh, he hit on head hard mm, with the blunt member and even after that he was so cruel even after that he stabbed on her neck and after that he took the car of my daughter and uh, killed himself. I got phone call that your daughter is no more. We went to Melbourne and went to the coroner's court where body of Deepshika was placed.
the moment was very disturbing in my life that moment is very disturbing the deg- degree of pain the degree of anguish and agony was highest in my life i i can't bear that degree many believe deepshika was a victim of dowry violence and not the only one despite being outlawed in india nearly 60 years ago dowry remains an integral part of the culture and a deadly one every hour a woman is killed in a dowry related incident as more indians move to australia there are fears the problem of dowry violence has come here too do you think deepshika's murder could have been avoided if there were laws around dowry in australia it would have definitely helped if everybody in the uh, support structures services understood that this can lead to serious consequences the dowry demands are escalating in australia and the domestic violence is happening in australia but there are no laws no culturally sensitive laws that can protect these young women Deep Shikers is not the only dowry related abuse case that slipped through the cracks in Australia with horrific consequences. How Winda Core also had an arranged marriage to an Australian citizen, Kulwinda Singh. From a farming family in one of India's poorest and least educated regions, her parents struggled to raise the dowry of gifts and gold. worth about $5,000. Her brother's wife, Amanpreet, says Parwinder's parents were determined to give their daughter a better life. In India, everybody's like overseas, maybe the life is more better. That's why when she called Metkarwinda, she she, she thinks she he was a very nice person, that's why she got married to him. But 8 years later, her marriage ended in tragedy. In December 2013, Parwinder burned to death in the driveway of her home. I can't even imagine. She gave so many years to him and suddenly he tried to blame that she did to herself. At the inquest into her death, Amanpri told the coroner that Parwinder's life had been a living nightmare ever since she arrived in Australia. and moved in with her husband and his parents they call her dangar all the time that's a really abusive word in india it's a it means like a stupid animal they treat her like she's a servant at home and she's working full time uh 7 days a week and still doing everything at home as well on top of this amanpreet says for many years all the money parwinder earned laboring in a mushroom farm went directly into her mother-in-law's bank account. She was very unhappy that her money is going into her mother-in-law's account. So she talk about it to Kulwinder and the whole money started going to Kulwinder's account. Such financial control is not unusual in dowry related abuse according to Dr. O'Connor. Whatever income she's earning from her job then he controls that. he takes over that because that is in lieu of the diary he wants or he expects that he didn't get and that sets up a lot of tension for her so as soon as she's making independent statements that suggest that she has a mind of her own that she is a person who will not be subjugated then that creates almost always the break up of the marriage and in Pa Winder's case Amanpreet says tensions rose after she secretly opened her own bank account. Kulwinder, uh, I think, found out that she's uh, keeping hundred dollars away from him, putting it into her own account. That's the when the peak of this abusive relationship, you know, this more started. The council assisting the coroner also described their relationship as abusive. Sometimes she tell me he kick her when she's sitting. or sometime if she eating mostly a injury is sometime you see on her legs you know blue marks so i ask her what happened she saying oh he pushed me i hit the you know the bedside 
so it hit me and that's why i got a blue mark she's thinking if nobody's knowing it it's fine for him to abuse her and in her mentality somewhere she's thinking that it's okay a man to treat a woman like that but by january 2013 the abuse got even worse at home alone and fearing for her life Pawinda made an emergency call to the police. My husband maybe killed me. But when the police arrived, Amanpreet says they failed to recognize the seriousness of her situation. The problem was the language. She can't speak English very well and she can't explain them what actually happened. And he said, I'm gonna kill you. And then I think somehow in the miscommunication, the, the work, it comes out that he gonna kick her out, you know. That's what they write when she was saying it. And they told Pravinda that they can send a warning letter to him about it. But then she said, no, it's fine, because as long as you guys know what's happening, I just want to let know. But the problem is, I think the police here did the wrong thing. I think second day they should bring someone, interpret what she was actually trying to say the night before but they didn't do it. Amanpri told the coroner that nine months later, Kulwinda went to India and threatened Parwinda's parents. It was just two months before her death. He was saying things to the family that she's a dungar, she can't do anything. And still, uh, I married her, took her to Australia, and now she's cheating me, she's putting money aside. He start abusing everyone, saying to the family that, you know, I can kill her, nobody will find out where she's gone. So Pravinder, that time, Pravinder started thinking for being, you know, one of the both. Bound by traditional beliefs that marriage lasts forever, it was a brave decision for Pawinda. But she would never get the chance to start a new life. 11 months after she first contacted police, she made another emergency call. What's happened there? My husband nearly killed me. But before the police could get to her, she ran from her house, engulfed in flames. The doctor came and he, he was started to sit down and he's gonna talk. My husband said, I don't wanna talk, I wanna see my sister. Uh, then, then he said, we, you know, just letting you know, we can't save her. It's... <sighs> that most of her, I mean, more than 80% of body is burned. <sighs> and she, she, she's not gonna survive. In 2015, Amanpreet attended the inquest into Parwinder's death. The coroner found there was evidence a known person had committed a criminal offence. The only other person at home on the day she died was her husband. We know Parwinda, she can't do it to herself. She never mentioned she can do it. She always said she can change them. The everything will be better. She was always positive about life. She, she don't want to end it, never mentioned that she's going to end it. Police are still investigating her death. No charges have been laid. Her husband has denied killing her and hasn't responded to our attempts to contact him. Sajana is another Indian woman who moved to Australia for marriage. She's one of the lucky ones, a survivor of dowry-related abuse. It's been like, am I, am I like money source machine that whenever you want me to earn, I will give, when you want my parents to give, they will give. And uh, what is this happening in my life? Yeah, he was uh, abusive sexually. Physically in the sense, he used to push me. Uh, like, he's tall and he used to strongly stop me. I used to cry and he used to catch my arms really strong and say, if you do this way, I'm gonna go out of the house or you gonna go out of the house and all these things. I used to be like scared. 
I lost my confidence and I can see myself uh, in a like falling down into very low or kind of hell I never expected that dowry has so much impact on the marriage an aerospace engineer before she was married she worked for Boeing in the United States for three years that time in US was the best time in my life. First time I was living out of my family with my friends and wow, it was like amazing. But coming from a very traditional Indian family, when she turned 27, her time as a single working woman had come to an end. Her parents matching her with a distant relative who was an Australian citizen. Sujana says his family bargained hard when it came time to talk dowry. Their demands was like uh, touching the sky, like the cars, the uh, silver. Uh, they were having like a lot of things. Uh, their list was too big actually. That's the reason dad said like I got up from there. I said I can't do anymore. Ultimately, she claims a dowry worth almost $40,000 was paid in cash, gold and silver but it didn't make for a happy marriage. After she came to live in Australia in 2010, Sujana says she endured two years of physical, mental and sexual abuse and believes dowry was at the heart of it. He wants thousands of dollars, which, is, which I know that my parents can't afford to do that. He used to shout at me that, uh, look at my friends, I don't have that um, you know, luck to get money from my parents. Um, you guys are like kind of beggars, you, did, you didn't do this uh, marriage really grand the way we thought. The way he used to scream at me, like I used to get like panic. And after a while, I think I started giving up. Whatever you want to do, you do it. I'm okay. At the end of 2011, heavily pregnant, she returned to India to give birth to their son. But unbeknownst to her, while she was there, her husband filed for divorce in Australia and tried to have her Australian visa application revoked. It was the ultimate humiliation for Sujana. Divorce is like you lost your social respect for a woman in India. And um, even though you're working, even though um, you're a good person, doesn't matter. If you're a divorcee, that means you're like social evil for the society. What happened to her is not uncommon, according to Dr. O'Connor. In Australia, I, there are this kind of practice is going on where the women are being abandoned because they did not bring enough dowry, which leads to a severe impact on their well-being, mental health, and generally on, you know, on, the, on the value of women. Sujana and her family have since lodged a dowry case in the Indian courts. Seven members of her ex-husband's family, including him, have been charged with dowry offences, ranging from dowry harassment to subjecting his wife to cruelty. They are charges that carry hefty fines and jail sentences of up to three years. But as long as Sujana's ex-husband remains in Australia, he'll avoid facing the Indian courts as he can't be extradited for such offences. They're waiting for him to come and attend an Indian court, which I'm sure that he's not going to do that. So you don't think anything is going to change for a long time? No, no. not at all. Now divorced and living back in Melbourne, Sujana has no hope the courts here can help her either. With no dowry laws, she's unable to mount a case against her ex-husband. My father has given all his earnings uh, from, like, when I was getting married, he got, he got retired and he planned to give all this uh, retirement money put on my marriage and it got wasted. I went to police, I explained the situation and they asked me, what is the major cause that you came here and talking to us? I said, that's money. They said, we, we don't have any evidence and he's not living with you anymore, so we can't help you. But that could soon change. In late 2016, a Royal Commission into Family Violence recommended legal changes in Australia to recognise dowry as a form of abuse. Uh, we want the dowry to be recognised as an act of domestic violence and it will help to bring the laws in line with what is happening in India. 
Sajana says that change can't come soon enough. If there is no dowry, then it will be a more happier life. He'll, if he want to get married to me, he'll marry me when he sees me as like, he sees like, this is the person and she is what she is. For Deepshika and Parwinda, it's all too late. But for future brides, it could mean the difference between love and a life of violence and misery.